Please follow the instructions of staff members and exit the building using the nearest exit. Two exits are provided on the left and right sides of the auditorium and three exits off the main concourse. Once you exit the auditorium, please proceed directly outside and stand away from the building. Thank you. That's funny. Schools and hospitals always, always have the same reaction. Welcome everyone. My name is uh, Ken Colwell and I'm uh, Dean of the School of Business here at CCSU and I want to uh, welcome you to a beautiful Wealthy Center uh, tonight. Uh, we are here for our annual American Savings Foundation Distinguished Banking Lecture, uh, which is uh, organized by uh, our Distinguished Banking Chair, Rich Leone. Where's Rich? Rich, let's give him a hand. Thank you very much. Rich specifically asked this year he wanted to get away from uh, being too oriented toward banking topics and he wanted to uh, address a topic that is uh, relevant to every business and every sort of organization and one that is extremely timely now uh, and uh, one that uh, I think we need more measured reasoned discussion about and I know this panel are the ones that are, are going to do it so I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. It's a very diverse panel in terms of their thinking and their background, and I think it's going to be a, uh, a lively discussion. Um, so before I turn it over, I did want to say that the panel specifically asked that instead of waiting till the end for questions, uh, that you should feel free to ask questions uh, as we go along. Uh, there should be two mics, although, do I see any mics? Oh, there are two, I'm sorry, okay, I, did, I somehow, bright lights are getting to me here. Um, so we have two mics up front, and uh, if you have a question that you would like to address, uh, uh, come on down, stand in front of the mic, and our moderator will be happy to, uh, to call on you. Um, so without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, the Chief Human Resource Officer and Senior Vice President of Human Resources at COCC, uh, Lisa Jacoby, who will be your moderator tonight. Good evening. So I have a wonderful opportunity to be moderating this panel tonight. And, these mo and the uh, panelists uh, just have some amazing stories and certainly uh, a timely topic to be talking about diversity, inclusion, and, uh, and equity. So um, just so everyone knows, I look, at, I look around this room tonight and all of you are coming from very different backgrounds. Some of you in here are from COCC. We have some folks from CCSU. We have business uh, professionals, we have entrepreneurs, we have small business owners, 
We have some students. Each one of you tonight in this discussion is going to take something different away. And the only thing that I can hope for is that each one of you maybe has a little bit of an aha moment, something that we discussed tonight that um, you can think about, perhaps even beyond two minutes driving out of here, that it actually stays with you. Because I think these topics are ones that are very, very important, no matter how, uh, no matter what industry you're in, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion and equity is, is something that uh, is very much paramount. And I, I also think that beyond where, where we're going, it's not just a, a numbers thought around diversity or how you're building out you know, inclusion around your space. I almost feel that this has become an ecosystem focus based on both employees, uh, students, clients, and communities, and how we're driving, you know, driving towards a future that's going to be more successful. So I'd like to introduce our panel, and um, I'll start here with, um, hold on, I just completely lost my train of thought, with, with George Perez. George is the State of Connecticut uh, Banking Commissioner. He has over 25 years of working experience in the banking industry, successful com commercial lending experience. He also, as many of you may know, has spent over 28 years being an activist for the city of New Haven. And George today is responsible today for laws pertaining to the state chartered banks, credit unions, consumer credit, broker-dealers, investment advisors, securities, and tender offers. So thank you, George, for being here. Appreciate it. <laughs> to his left is Dr. Zuma Toro, who is the president of uh, Central Connecticut State University. She, her career spans five different institutions. And the one thing that I found very interesting of having an opportunity to get to know each one of these panelists is Dr. Toro basically identifies herself with three words. An engineer first, then a Latino, and then a female. So a uh, very unique uh, way of being describing herself and had a great time getting to know her. She currently is focused on leading her, in her university to a new level of consciousness regarding and centered around diversity, inclusion, and equity. To her left is... To her left is Fred Colon. He is the Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer and Head of Organizational Effectiveness at Travelers. And he spent uh, 20 years at Travelers, and I can certainly tell you by spending some time getting to know uh, Fred, you would think that he's two years in. Lively, <laughs> engaged, great stories, and he spent three years as the uh, Chief Diversity Officer at Travelers. And I also think Fred will be talking a little bit later on about uh, Travelers' focus on diversity and they've developed an executive diver diversity council, which is chaired by their CEO, and really a, a good testament to some of the work that they've been doing at Travelers. So thank you, Fred. <laughs> and last but certainly not least is Andrea Hawkins, the partner at the Clarion Group. Her career spans over 20 years of executive and leadership experience within a multitude of industries, including healthcare, insurance, and financial services. Her experience includes also strategic planning, uh, developing transformational culture changes, operations, just to name a few. And her recent work has really been partnering with nonprofits and organizations of all types to really be focused on what's next. So we've segmented out this panel. Sorry. We've segmented out this panel tonight into kind of four succinct areas. And we could be talking about many of these for even over an hour, uh, but we're going to do our best to have a good dialogue around topics that uh, we think are pertinent to what's going on today. So I'm going to start with a question to, with Dr. Dr. Toro. And really the question is really around a leader championing for change. And we all know it really starts there. So Dr. Toro, when you took office two years ago, um, you, you had mentioned to me you made it a priority to go on a listening tour and meet with every office within the university. And your overall goal was to really understand what their central challenge was. Can you share with the audience tonight uh, what trends you found in this initiative? First of all, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for spending part of your evening with us, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak uh, about a topic so dear to me. Yes, uh, as part of my listening tour, I went and visited every academic department and every support office. And what was interesting to me, after being in four other universities, that Central was the first institution in which I got a clear message 
not only from the students, but from faculty and staff. They felt that there was a divide in terms of ethnic groups. There was a divide in terms of diversity and of ideas, and that they felt the institution didn't really appreciate the di diversity that we have as an institution, that despite the fact that in the last five to seven years, our student population has significantly changed from one that was not too diverse to one that it's very diverse in the sense that now 34% of our students come from uh, underserved population or diverse uh, populations that we don't, we didn't have the environment that really was encouraging the success of those students and not only the success of the students, but it was not an environment conducive to the success of faculty and staff from diverse background, backgrounds. Uh, definitely, I was able to identify that as a top priority for me in terms of transforming their organization. Because if we want to be that institution that serves the sons and daughters of the working class of the state of Connecticut, we need to be a nurturing place for diversity, diversity in all its dimensions. We are not talking about only ec an ec the ethnic background. We are not talking about gender diversity. We are talking about diversity of ideas. We are talking about diver diversity of experiences, diversity of fields as well. And that was not the environment I found at Central when I came. Thank you for sharing that. Appreciate that. And that, and that, and that is a, fa uh, a, a great um, evaluative point. I find, and there's a belief, right, that you can have diversity and no inclusion, and you can have inclusion and no diversity. So that as, as we as practitioners or believers in diversity and inclusion, um, instead of looking at the things that haven't worked over the last 30 years, we have to look at the system. And you use the word systems, right? What's the culture of the place? Because in order to have both, you have to focus on both, the D and the I. Fred, can you share a little bit, you know, I, I find it, in, and you have, you guys have this right on Traveler's website, your focus on diversity, on mm -hmm. your, you know, you guys have an executive diversity council that obviously is chaired by your CEO, which is great because it helps you make your life easier, I'm sure, yeah. and all the things that you're doing. Uh, can, you, can you share a little bit with the audience tonight, uh, you know, how that's helped you in, in the efforts that you guys are doing? Yes, I, I think most, if, if, if any of you have ever worked in a corporate setting, which I have most of my career, um, <clears throat> we tend to target things at the middle of the organization and, and believe that they can take off just in the middle. And what we've learned is that for things related to almost anything that you do in, in, a, in a corporate setting, you need leadership from the top. So we, we have formed, um, th there's 41 executives, top executives in the company committed to our Executive Diversity Council that's chaired between our CEO, our CHRO, and myself, and my role as CDO. Um, but we also take the accountability for the execution of the strategy down to every single key leader in the organization. So we, uh, we, we start with 41, and we've organized uh, three additional. One comprised of business heads because they're marketplace facing, meaning they know what's happening in, outside of the four walls of travelers. Um, we have a second council that we call our executive sponsors to our employee resource groups, which are diversity networks, which are employee-led to influence change on DNI um, inside the organization through those um, employee resource groups. And then we have a third group comprised of our senior field leaders because more than 70% of our organization is spread out across the U.S. So it's important for us to have those leaders leading change directly in those states where our employees are housed or live or reside and work. So those three councils help us address and advance our strategy. Excellent. Let me just uh, make a point about how different the environment is in higher education. And uh, specifically at Central, uh, I definitely uh, have the opportunity of establishing priorities. However, change will not come from the top. I have to engage 
faculty, staff, and students if we are, go and the administration, if we are going to see change happening. The other thing that happened in higher education is that the change happens in a very slowly uh, way. And you will not see change overnight. It will take years for an institution of high, higher education to transform itself. And we talk about culture a lot, that it's not just one person that drives culture. Um, and everyone, everyone, to your act, actual exact point there, Dr. Toro, plays a part in, in making that change happen. Um, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Fred, do you mind sharing a little bit um, to kind of, kind of deepen that conversation around what some of the work you guys have done at Travelers in discussion around you know, your current learning strategy? Mm -hmm. And you had shared with me that culture exploration is your, really that focus of what's next. So mm -hmm. you've been rooted in this industry for a long time. Can you share a little bit tonight on what you guys are doing from the topic of culture exploration? Maybe it also share what that exactly is. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because we all live in cultures, right? And we walk in out of um, um, moments where we experience culture in that moment. And it, depending on where it is, it's, it's just, it's different. And a recognition, we have to start there that the people are different, you're different, your reaction is different. So we, we've, for the last decade, my predecessor before myself, we spent a lot of time, uh, a lot of time on the right things around the D and, and the I from an education perspective, from an awareness perspective. Um, from the head place, as I would say it. Um, and, and now we're looking and saying, okay, so, so let's really move to the heart part of the equation, which is really talking about how we do inclusion. And inclusion begins with culture, because culture, culture is how we behave. And what we know is, um, Dr. Steve Robbins has, has a saying, he says, um, the more effort you put into understanding, the more you understand. All right, so instead of pushing people away because you're different, lean in, right, and, and, and begin to understand. And you, you'll begin to discover, right, that wow, the, these are differences that, can, that can, I can appreciate. So, so we're putting a lot of effort into what we're calling cultural exploration to get people to understand that in, in, in cultures there are always outsiders and insiders. And what does an outsider feel like when they're an outsider? And how does an insider feel when they're an insider and has privilege? Right? And when I say privilege, I'm not talking just about uh, the color of skin. I'm talking about things like perks like, you know, parking, um, access, um, who you meet, who you talk to, how you get selected. But more importantly, that in order to, be, to do mindful engagement um, in, in terms of cultural exploration, we have to practice um, very, very much uh, doing recognition, reflection, and then responding, right? Because that's how we begin to engage mindfully and understanding and understand others. So that's that, that's our focus in um, uh, 2019. I, I want to just add to that. So uh, great point about listening and leaning in. Um, I, I think, though, in order to do that effectively, you have to really actively listen. So sometimes we're in a conversation with someone who maybe has a different point of view than ours. And what are we sometimes doing? We're like waiting to respond. We're waiting to give our alternate point of view um, instead of, to Fred's good point, of trying to understand where the person is coming from or trying to better understand what that person's experience has been, maybe different than your own. So active listening, right, is that whole art of, let me make sure I understand what you mean. I hear you saying this, do you mean that, and really getting clarification on it, as opposed to trying to formulate your answer for why you're disagreeing with the person in front of you. And it's really hard, and it takes a lot of practice to restrain yourself because you feel like you have a good answer and it might be the right answer, but I would just strongly encourage you to sort of step back and think about how to actively listen in the moment. Give yourself a minute, pause, take a breath, and just listen to what the person is saying. Ask questions where you don't understand. So that active engagement, I think, is the step toward understanding to the good point that Fred was just making. Something that is very important for us to keep in mind is that we are, uh, what our life experiences have made of us. And uh, even when it may have been many years that we had certain experiences, we still have that with us. 
and that will determine how we react or how we act and what we do in certain circumstances. And even when we don't want to acknowledge that, as we are growing up, we develop biases and stereotypes. And even when we don't want to acknowledge that, we bring that to the table. Every time we're having a conversation, we bring that to the conversation. And let me just share with you a very concrete example to explain or to illustrate what I want to say by the biases. Many years ago, I had a, a lawyer who was working with me, a very forward-looking uh, woman. She had two daughters, again, uh, college-educated uh, uh, females, and one of them had a girl. She has a daughter, a five-year daughter. So it was a Friday afternoon, the lawyer come to me and she said, I need to go, I, I, I really need, need to go. I won't be able to be in the, in the uh, meeting with you. And I look at her, it was a very important meeting for us. And she said, I know it's an important meeting, but I have something else to do, more important than the meeting. And I was taking it back, but I respected her uh, argument. And she said, I have to take my granddaughter to buy her a bat and a ball. And I look at her like, oh my goodness, she is crazy. And she said, no, I need to do that and I need to do that today. My daughter won't buy a bat and a ball for my granddaughter. I, not, I need to teach both of them that what it takes to make a change, an impact in the way we think is just to buy a bat and, and a ball a bat and a ball instead of a doll. So th that, that shows you the type of biases we bring to the table. A well-educated female won't buy a bat and a ball because that's for, for a boy, not for a girl. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Toro, that point is, it's, the, the story is powerful because we all come from a culture where we've learned things, we have beliefs. Um, and in and th and those beliefs, we have judgments, and there are things that are right and things that are wrong. And so we, we, we are uh, at Travels imparting to our leaders the notion around, and when, when that happens, we preserve and protect, or we allow and tolerate, right? As opposed to saying, is it possible that there's another way, which is what you're, what you're describing. There, it, there is an alternative here mm -hmm. to just preserve and protect girls don't play baseball, right? Et cetera, et cetera, because that's how they, it manifests behaviorally. That's an excellent story. I, I supervise, oversee an agency of 119 people. Most of them are what we would call auditors. So they have one thing in common, right? They like accounting, economics, and finance, because we also regulate securities. And the seat is very much one plus one is two. There's no deviation from it. There's not a lot of, uh, they're great people, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. <laughs> but they don't, you know, it's blue suits, gray suits, right? Uh, so one of the things I did when I first came, came into the agency, I, I, I met with my direct reports. The agency is divided into six divisions, so I have six division directors. So one of the things I asked them is, what does diversity mean to you? Right? So they basically went to the easy part, or what most people perceive it to be, which is uh, color of your skin, you know, black, white, Asian, and so forth. So to make a long story short, I define diversity much more broad, similar to what the, Dr. Toro defined it. So I look at them and say they're very highly educated, top notch in the field, really good people. But some of them that never even ever heard of the Martin Luther King's speech, top of the mountain, you know? So I had to bring people in to expose them through other cultures and other beliefs and other definitions of the word diversity. And we, I did that by bribing them, by buying them lunch, because I can't force them to do it, right? So I would say, we're gonna have brown bags, but instead of you bringing the lunch, we will buy lunch for you, and we'll bring speakers in. And everything from the, uh, the uh, this is what they call, so if anybody's offended, I'm sorry. The Negro Infantry for the Civil War, there's a, there's a series that the library does, the State Library, we brought people in there to talk about that. We did bring somebody in that did the speech, uh, it sounded like Dr. Luther King, Dr. Perkins from New Haven, 
and we've done other activities to get people to start thinking outside the box. So as simple as you would think that very highly educated, well meant, the definition was different. So it's interesting when you think about these, these examples and it's cr trying to create an, an, an environment where people feel comfortable. And we talk about a lot of this at COCC. We, we did do unconscious bias training last year for the first time. And, and it was centered around the premise that we want to build a culture, and regardless whether it's work, anywhere you are, you're most comfortable when you feel like you can be you. Right. And so when you're comfortable and you can feel like you can be you, your true, your true self comes out. You perform better. You feel like you're, you're, in, you're in the right groove. And we've talked a lot about that, about building an area where everyone, no matter where background you are, what role you're playing, can feel engaged. And we know that when you feel engaged, you intrinsic, intrinsically your performance goes up. And when your performance goes up, everybody wins. And that's true regardless of what industry you're in, mm -hmm. um, you know, what role you play, is I do believe that everyone can play a part of this, regardless of if you're leading teams, if you're not, creating a value around that. Um, so much of you know, the conversation around diversity and inclusion starts talking about talent, right? And the, and the bleed for talent, companies and organizations needing to ensure that they have got great talent, that they're acquiring great talent. So when you start from a mindset of a non-inclusive mindset, you're starting at less than 100% versus 100% of the people that you actually want to gain um, for a to be an employee or to, you know, for, uh, for gaining a new customer. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I had an opportunity to individually speak with each one of our panelists. And, you know, speaking with George, he shared a lot with me around the, you know, this, this reality that he doesn't see that in the banking industry yet that there's a crisis. Um, and you've said in, until that crisis is there, you don't think that people will make larger changes. What do you believe, uh, George, you know, from the, the banking and credit union space, from the financial institution space, um, how do you think that's going to change for them to be able to drive younger talent into, you know, not only the, to them as an organization for employees, but also younger talent, you know, as, as the customer base? Because we all know that so much of things need to be the marriage between what your employee demographic is usually also shows what your customer demographic is. First of all, you, you have to understand the industry, right? The mindset. Um, financial institutions, which goes beyond banks and credit unions, those are mortgage company, mortgage servicers, and so on. Uh, they live in a world that, again, one plus one equals two, right? You, you give me a check, I cash it for you, I ask you for ID. Does not, and I'm generalizing, right? There are some bankers who are fun. I haven't found too many of those, but there are some. Uh, so first you gotta understand the audience you're dealing with, right? And as an industry, they don't adapt well to change in general, right? Uh, and they're normally not the pioneers, except for the fintech companies, uh, of change. So in my opinion, and some people would disagree with this, I don't think that particular industry has really yet made the effort, investment, to realize things are changing around them, right? And if you're not part of the leadership of it, if you're not leading, you're gonna be a follower or even a has-been. You know, you will be the next Sears or, or the next Kmart or the next DeWitt, I'm not gonna make myself real old, uh, which is, uh, we used to be a company like Best Buy, uh, that if you don't keep up with the times and you don't keep up with the changes in your industry, you won't be around. In fact, people sometimes ask me why some of the mergers that go on. Greed is one, because people can make a lot of money on it. Other is they don't plan for the future. They don't have a asset strategy for that CEO who's 68 years old and who's gonna take over, right? Mm -hmm. Some of it is they have not kept up with the times and, and realize that the war around you has changed totally. Um, if you have kids and you, and you take a, have them take a picture of, your, of their friends and then look at a picture when you were in high school and you see how different the picture's gonna look of the people who are in that picture. Uh, and I think in the industry, and again, I'm generalizing, some people get this good, but in general, uh, the industry I represent still needs to wake up. Right. There, there are five generations in the workplace right now. Five generations. There's probably five generations here tonight as well. <laughs> <laughs> probably five generations here tonight. So when you think about going into work every day, 
and you know you have you know one generation uh, there's there's not a lot of disagreement on what needs to be done in the workplace sometimes there is but generally speaking everyone understands the goals of the organization where there gets to be sticky situations is the how how are we going to do it so I was in a meeting the other day and I was talking my client was there and we were and they were talking about the fact that they weren't doing a great job of planning their tasks out they needed to do a better job so that if someone was out, they would know what things needed to con continue to get done. So there was no question in the organization that they needed to do a better job at managing their tasks. But one person said, we should all get paper planners. It's so important for us to have paper planners. And then that way, people can leave their planners on their desk. If someone's out, we can just go to their paper planner and take a look at what needed to get done that day. Right? And inevitably, there was a millennial. Where are the millennials in the room here? Ah, there you are, <laughs> that said, really? Why don't we just put it on our electronic calendars? <laughs> we all have access to the calendars. Why don't we just make it public, right? So there was no disagreement that it was important to track, track the tasks and for everyone to be able to know what needed to get done and when, um, but it was this whole house. So that's the work to be done here when we think about diversity in the organization. How do you manage between those different ideas? How do you get to a place that works for everyone? Um, how do you make sure that the goals of the organization, most importantly, are addressed and get handled? So those are the types of issues that every organization is grappling with with five generations in the workplace. Is there an easy answer? No, there isn't an easy answer, but I feel like with conversations and some compromise, I think that organization decided that if people wanted paper planners, they could have them, but they were going to use the electronic calendars, the millennials one. <laughs> um, and so those are the types of things that organizations are grappling with today, and they are real, real issues. We are uh, facing similar challenges at, at Central because uh, we serve a very uh, diverse student population, not only in terms of ethnic background, socioeconomic background, but also age. Uh, we don't have the typical uh, college age student here only. We serve that student population, but we serve also the adult learner. And we even have what we consider the senior uh, faculty, and it's they are senior citizens who are attending classes as well, and we want to serve them. So the issue is how you put together the support services that will allow this diverse uh, student population to be successful, and how you get to them, and we are uh, an age friendly institution, that is a designation that we decided uh, some time ago to go for. And, and that definitely is a designation that we want to keep and live by. And if we are going to do that, then we need to educate our faculty, we need to educate our staff in terms of what is needed to be able to, to support that type of staff. Fred, you guys at uh, Travelers have really done an amazing job with your Travelers Edge program. How you've you know converted people coming into your organization, really being able to move the needle with you know continuing to hire you know to hire diverse talent. We all know that innovation comes from the people that are not like us next to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak a little bit about about that tonight and some of the things that you guys have been doing to continue yeah. to kind of move the needle? Yeah. Yes. The the Edge program in particular. Well, they you know, to your point. Um, a, uh, a talent strategy. So if you think about the demographics and the geography in which we live, um, how are we um, leveraging, uh, bringing that talent to travelers, right? And, and, and getting them ready, ready early in career. I, I t I'll read to you what Traveler's Edge is. Traveler's Edge, which uh, stands for um, Empowering Dreams for Graduation and Employment, uh, provides a unique holistic approach to educate uh, for, to educate underrepresented, underrepresented students through partnership with colleges, universities, and community-based organizations. And Central is one of those uh, uh, um, institutions. And what we do is, from the point they are in middle school into high school, is we prepare them to go into secondary education and not only get in, but complete their education and be prepared to take on a job of 
of their choice at a corporation that they want to work at. In, in, in the case of travelers, we want to recruit as many of them as possible. And so we've been at this since 2007, and I've got to tell you that we're on record this year, hopefully, we're currently at, with Central, for instance, 13 out of our 18 grads, or 72% are your students, and we hope to have a 100% um, conversion rate um, by the end of this year. And these um, students go on uh, to advance their careers in the case of travelers. Retention is just as critical as sourcing and attracting because if you don't keep them, then you're, 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 you're losing. Um, and for us who've been involved with EDGE in particular, we're pleased to see things like these kids getting married, buying homes, having children, right? So having access to the full American, American dream, it's, just, it's, it's a great story for us and it's a great story more importantly for them. That's great. I, I should say that following the uh, travels, Travelers Edge model, we have a similar program with Pratt and & Whitney, and uh, they also hire the students who are part of that program. So, and if there are any uh, representative from other companies who would like to use that strategy to develop talent, we are more than willing to speak to you. In the banking world, we try to imitate something that the insurance world did in Hartford. They had an actuary boot camp that the different uh, insurance companies got, got together. And the idea was to introduce actuary to non-traditional people who would think of that field. So we did a banking boot camp. And the first year was a typical homogeneous group. And the kids came from you know, some of the best colleges in the world. So for the second year, I wanted to mix it more, right? So I was more active in trying to direct recruitment, right? And not that I have anything against my alma mater, UNH, or Quinnipiac, or UConn, or Yale, or Fairfield, but I wanted the, the choices to come from different areas. Uh, that was difficult uh, for bankers to uh, accept that. In fact, I had to take two of the bankers that was in that group and call the CEOs and say, don't send them back. Uh, so. It's a lot of work still to be done. Mm -hmm. George, do you mind sharing um, a little bit, even just as you've been in your office, uh, you know, as the uh, state of Connecticut uh, banking commissioner, you've mentioned even just, I think hiring, was it your securities officer? Was a, was a new experience? Well, it's not a security officer, but one of the divisions is security. Divi di sorry, and they, securities right, division. Right. Thank you. And, and they, sorry, it's the technology no speaking problem. through me. No problem. <laughs> And they, and they uh, that's a division that supervises, regulates uh, the Golden Sachs of the world if they do business in Connecticut, the Lehman Brothers when they were around, uh, which they didn't do much business uh, here. They did a lot in New York. Um, financial advisors and so forth. The department has been in, around for 182 years. Uh, securities have not been something that we have uh, regulated for 182 years. We're probably for about 80, 90 years. So the person that was there for about 20 years retired. He didn't want to be part of the change and he was ready to retire, so he retired. So we did a search and, uh, and I asked someone from the Economic Development uh, Department, someone from the Attorney General's Office, and someone from the Labor Department to be my search committee. And they came up with the top three candidates. It has happened that the top candidate happened to be a female. Uh, it was the best qualified person. Uh, but we have affirmative action goals, and my affirmative action goals say it had to be a white male. And the reason they say it had to be a white male was because in that industry, when they, they look at the census, and based on the census, they say your workforce, your leadership should reflect the census of those, of those field. So I went with the recommendation of the group, which is the number one person happened to be a female, who came from Prudential, who was the best qualified, uh, but that was the first time in the history of the department. The department, like I stated, has been an assistant 182 years. We never had a female commissioner. I'm the first Hispanic commissioner. Uh, you would think that that would have happened a long time ago. There's only been one African-American commissioner. Part of that is because the industry, right? A lot of, it's not an industry that attracts a lot of people from, with diversity. Uh, but it needs to change. Uh, and, and I can tell you, when I had to go and present my affirmative action report, I got criticized because I hired a female. <laughs> I said, okay, thank you for your time, and move away. 
you know, I, I, I thought I should be patted on the back, right? And I didn't hire her because she was female, right? She was the best qualified person who happens to be female. The number two person was very close to her, but the one thing that attracted me more about her than the number two person was that she was not your typical banker, right? And, and, and she had a lot of experience in change and in every way, shape, or form. Uh, and she came to the interview, you know, didn't look like your typical banker. Mm. You know, George, what's interesting about that at dinner, um, there was a woman sitting at my table, I believe she works for uh, the university, and she discovered that she's the first woman in her role, and she was surprised, right? And, and that's the case that most of people of our generation would be surprised. Um, and it's interesting to me, just this morning on uh, the Today Show, uh, I shared with my, uh, the table I was having, uh, sharing dinner with, there was a young woman who's 13 years old. I believe her name is Angie Paul. She wrote a book called Raise Your Hand. Right, because at 13, she's sitting in her classroom, and she realizes all the guys, all the boys are raising their hands, and the girls are not, and that's not good enough. And I think that's what we're up against, right? And it's the right thing. Is the level of consciousness? It's just it's younger people are realizing, no, that's not right, and they're doing something. Because I don't know that if that were something I would do when I was 13 years old. So, so more and more, we have to be prepared as, um, you know, academic institutions, um, businesses, prepared for the workforce and what they're going to demand and want. Um, yes, in terms of fairness and we call it fairness, equity, you know, whatever the case may be. But that's that's what that's what they're going to insist on on having, and we have to be ready to de to deliver. So I, I would just add to that, uh, very excited that um, in the statistics around entrepreneurs, who do you think are the largest population of entrepreneurs? Women. 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 So go, ladies. Keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ken, did you have a question? No, I'm just standing here. You're no. just standing here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't no, know. You look like you were just doing great just standing here. No, I wanted to, uh, before we get too far away from, uh, from the EDGE program, which of course in my position I see firsthand what an excellent program that is, and one of the things that I see that they do so very well is to make the students feel like they belong here. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, I think, a problem that we have with diversity. We've been talking a lot about attraction here, um, but the retention is a real issue. How do we make uh, um, diverse populations, once they're in the organization, what do we do to make sure that they feel comfortable there, that they feel like this is a place where they can excel and they can exceed, and that this is a place they belong? I'm going to talk about equity. Is this a great time to? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. So, so we've started talking about diversity, right, which is a representation of different thoughts and ideas and experiences, right? So. It's not enough for an organization to have those differences. They need to have inclusion. They need mm -hmm. to invite those different voices to the table and have them be involved in the shape and the, in the pace of the organization, right? Inclusion. Um, and then we have equity. So, you know, equity is not equality. Equality means everybody gets the same thing and you're supposed to thrive if you get what the person next to you gets. Equity is about getting the person getting what they need to succeed. So it's really important to sort of understand the individual and understand what that person needs. So I have a little bit of an analogy. So diversity is like seeds. Think about all the variety of seeds you have in the world, on the planet, right? You have tree seeds and fruit seeds and flower seeds and all kinds of different seeds. That's diversity. Inclusion is where the seeds live. So think of that, that inclusion as, you know, the organization. So for a seed, it would be soil, right? A seed lives in some sort of soil or water or however it lives. It lives in an environment. Equity is how we treat that seed. So does every seed need the same amount of water? No. Does every seed need the same amount of sunlight? No. So every seed needs what that seed needs. So when you think about an individual in an organization, they don't need the exact same thing that the person sitting next to them needs. They need what they need. So it's really important to understand where that person is, how that person has gotten to the point where they are, and what they need to be their best self in the organization. 
So how do you create that environment? You have to get to know that individual. You have to create the right environment. You have to make sure that they feel welcome, whatever welcome means for them. So you and I don't necessarily want the same thing. We all know what the golden rule is, right? What's the golden rule? Treat others the way you want to be treated. In this work, it's so important, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is to live by the platinum rule. Who knows what the platinum rule is? One person's raising their hand. Say it. <laughs> Woohoo! So Did everyone hear that? There you go. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Applause. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Treat others the way they want to be treated. So in this work of diver diversity, equity, and inclusion, it really is all about meeting that person where they are and helping them get to where they want to get to, not where you hope they want to get to, but where they are interested in getting to. So it's really important to get to know that individual. Let me just make some comments about the, the environment in higher education. One thing that uh, we face with a diverse student population like the one we have at Central is that Another dimension of diversity is the learning styles. Every one of these individuals may have a different learning style. And that's why the traditional or the uh, pedagogical approaches that we use 20, 25 years, even 12 years ago, may not be relevant anymore. And that's the challenge. It's a challenge for us in higher education, not only in terms of what we do in the classroom, but what we do outside of the classroom as well. And I mentioned the support services we need. Every one of these groups, every one of these individuals that we are trying to educate, we are in the process of educating at Central, need a different type of support services. But we need to recognize as uh, teachers, as uh, professors, we need to recognize that we need to continue to evolve, we need to continue to learn and adapt what we do in the classroom to the students we have. We cannot teach the students we wish we have. We need to teach the students we have. I mean, one of the things we did in the agency is something was very simple, and when people first saw it, they say, okay, what is he, crazy? I put a map in the wall of the entire world, right? And then encourage people to put a pen where they're from or their ancestors are from. So people started doing that. And guess what happened then? So people started talking to each other about what's unique about that country or what's unique about that culture or, or so forth. So has people talking to each other, getting to know each other better, was to me a success. Uh, another thing that I've done is when we have a lot of retirements because when people come to work for the state, for the particular department of banking, they don't quit. There are some that I wish they quit, but uh, they don't quit. Uh, so I have a lot of people, you know, the average age, average time in the department of banking, 32 years. You know, uh, that is going down because I have 13 retirements in the last six, seven months. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I've been doing is not replacing it with higher level auditors. I've been replacing it with trainees. And the purpose of that is because I want a much more diverse workforce than what I typically get. And by diverse, I don't necessarily only mean male, female, white or black. Diverse in every way, shape, or meaning of that word. So to me, I use the word diversity very broad. Uh, so one of the things I, I instituted was develop an individual development plans for each one of those employees. I get the choice that I owe their employees too if they want to participate based on the, the classification of their position. Not one single one of the people that have been there more than 25 years are interested in having an individual development plan. It has to leave me alone to do what I've done for the last 30 years the way I've done it and I'll be happy. Um, but the younger ones, I want to make sure they can f and by younger ones, they don't necessarily are 20 years old, okay? Because you could be a trainee and be 30 years old. You could be 35 years old. You could be new to the industry. But the newer people into the department, they need that guidance to succeed, right? And, and, and I also made it a requirement that all my division directors, part of the review one quarter is diversity. Define the broadest possible way, including the success of those new people coming in and developing that plan. 
and addressing issues as they come up. And don't wait for it to become part of the performance review. If it becomes part of the performance review, that means you fail in my eyes. Then it'll become part of your performance review. So, I mean, that's helped to accept the new people. And at least in the, in the anonymous polls we're taking, it appears to be working. You know, all of you have said something that touches on culture, touches on individual uh, being. Um, you know, one of the things we're spending a lot of time at, our, at Travelers talking about is being. And I say that, you said something about women as entrepreneurs. Um, there's an organization called Influencer that's led by a woman investor. Because what women find is when they are pitching, and they're pitching to men, men don't understand. Right, so, so men don't, or not men, not only men, but we don't do immersion into things that are different to how I am, who I am, where I live, what my background and history has been. We pretty much are humans and we're more robotic than we think we're not. Mm -hmm. So we're always just being, being, being. And, um, and so what, what one of the interview interviewees said, you know, when I talk to a male investor, he'll say, well, well, let me go home and talk to my wife or talk to my niece, right? And so we've got to find a way, right, to do meaningful immersion and, 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 and challenge our own curiosity. And, and I'll tell you a funny story because it's, it's, it's funny but not funny, but it provokes executives I work with at Travelers. I'm, I'm always touched by the fact that when my colleagues and typically uh, my white male brothers and sisters come back and say to me, Fred, I went to Puerto Rico and it was fabulous. And I said, great, and I had a good time and I had this wonderful dish. And if you've ever, anybody in here ever been to Puerto Rico on a vacation? Do you have a favorite dish? What is it? <laughs> That's interesting. Usually people say mofongo. I knew. Like, I knew. <laughs> no, and I laughed because to the one, right? They'll say, and they're so proud of themselves, they had mofongo. <laughs> And I'll say, that's great, but six blocks from the office, there are 13 restaurants that serve mofongo. Right? And I say all that just to say this, that when we begin to step out of, of protect, preserve, allow, um, uh, allow and tolerate to discover and learn about differences, then you, we begin their journey of appreciation. So to the extent that we can connect that way with things that I've never done, um, visit with people I've never visited, not a one week vacation in you know, Tahiti, no, but really, 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 really invest time. Then you're working both your head and your heart when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And that's when differences, or di a difference begins to happen. So just, I just want you to think about that. That's a big one, and I think I would add to that. I think your mic blew up here. Here, try this one. Did it blow up? I heard that boof. Would that mean? What did you do to the microphone, Andrea? You blew a fuse. Oh my goodness, my booming voice. Um, it, it's this whole notion of unconscious bias mm -hmm. versus conscious competence, right? So again, sort of moving on the path from not just realizing I may have things in my mind that are just there and have been planted as seeds from being a baby or having you know an experience with a, a group of, a, a group that I only identify with my own identity to. I'm curious, I'll continue to be curious, thank you very much, um, and I'll learn in this process and be more forward and more focused on understanding someone else's um, point of view. So again, you know, from that unconscious bias to I'm consciously competent. I'm aware that I may have a point of view that is rooted only in my experience and there are other experiences so how do I move myself to conscious competence? So that's, a, it, it's a journey to move on. Let me uh, just share with you uh, an experience that I had just recently. And some of the people here will relate to what I am going to say because it happened just last week and some of them were involved in this. Uh, I was thinking that Central was making good progress towards uh, embracing diversity in all its dimension, inclusion and equity. However, uh, last week or the week before, the steering committee for the strategic planning process put together uh, five working groups 
And I asked for uh, the membership of the working groups to be representative of who we are as, in, uh, as an institution. So the committee nominated people and after uh, that meeting, I reviewed the composition of the work groups with the facilitator of the process. And we look at each other and we said, we have a problem here. Most of the representatives were from the same college. Most of the representatives were white. There was not any real diversity in the composition of the work groups. So that is a clear indication that even when we want to do the best, sometimes those biases that we come with are going to follow us. We will do and deal with what is familiar to us, what makes us feel comfortable. And let me say that uh, the experience goes a little bit further. The five strategic priorities, priorities of, or themes that have been identified by Central, none of them include explicitly diversity, inclusion, and equity. So Dr. Toro had discussed this with me a little bit, and, and if, um, for me to kind of recap that, that your exercise of going through and building out your strategic plan, what those five areas need to be as the, or, as the university transforms itself, that those committees have come back and none of them yet have spelled out directly a need to grow from a diversity, inclusion, and equity standpoint. So I found this conversation fascinating on a couple of fronts. Uh, but I also found it more fascinating that Dr. Toro was letting them eventually, hopefully, figure this out on their own. And if they don't figure it out on their own, as the leader championing for change, what are you going to do about it? You know, <laughs> I think that I am going to use an executive privilege with that. I can tell you now, diversity, inclusion, and equity will be one of our strategic priorities moving forward. I, you know, I, yeah, go ahead. I, I was yeah. just going to say, um, so why I love that is um, this work does have to begin with leaders. Leaders have to um, set the pace for what change is happening in their organizations. It is important for certain that the middle and you know the people at all levels need to be engaged. But quite frankly, if the leaders don't step up and say this is a business imperative for us, this is important for us, this is important for our future, it will not happen. It will not be sustained. It has to start with the leadership. And all the leaders have to be on board because if there's a tiny crack, if anyone slips and you know, goes, goes against this business imperative, it just will not come to fruition. You will not get where you're trying to get to from a diversity, equity, and inclusion, bless you, standpoint. But I think that it's more than a business imperative. For sure. It's For sure. a societal. Imperative. Agree. Our society needs to have this as a priority for all of us. We can stop a lot of things, but let me tell you, the demographic change in this country from all its dimensions, there is no way to stop it. Absolutely. We better learn how we can work and live with that how we can make the best out of our diverse population, how we can continue to be the nation, the leader we are as a country by embracing diversity, by embracing equity, and elevating the quality of life of all the citizens of this country. 
Otherwise, if we are not committed to that, I can guarantee you 10, 20, 30 years from now, we will not be that leader of the world we have been. Yeah. And, and I would add to, so I would add to what you, the, both of you have said, which is absolutely accurate, that um, speaking in a way that others will listen, right? So, so, so if you want to move someone from preserved and protect to tell me why that is, is get them to reflect on a time when they felt different and what did that feel like? And, and, and what I've learned, and particularly with white men, um, that when you have that conversation, things begin to transform. Because for the most part, everyone has experience being different, right? And so if you get there, then you consider them. So imagine someone who can't change your gender or who can't change their skin color and can't have access, then they can lean into the conversation and see the possibilities, right? And become part of creating the possibilities. Because the other thing I've learned in particular with, um, from white, working with white men is that oftentimes when they become interested in this topic of diversity is when their daughters go into the workforce. <laughs> right? No, or, or a child comes out as lesbian, gay, whatever the case may be, and now they're like confronted because it challenges their own paradigm, and so they want to lean into it. So I, I would ask that um, we learn to have conversations that are constructive, that address just what you've described, because it takes all of us, and it's not leaving out white men right. or white women or white people in general. They, they've got to be part, uh, they have to be of the conversation and the partnership that's critical. So we have any questions from the audience? You know, I think, um, you know, I know we kind of went through a good amount and, you know, each one of these panelists are here to answer anything. Any questions? Make it work for us. Okay. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Javon Evans and actually um, I'm part of the Travel Desert Program like here at Central. So when I was thinking about it, it's just like listening to everybody talk. There's a question that I've always had, like when I'm when I think to myself being a part of this program, I've only ever seen it from my my perspective, so I can't really think about how it is to implement something like this. But like when you see that a part of your organization or a part of your company is kind of stagnant in terms of diversity and inclusion, like what, in your opinion, like the panelists, what do you think is the hardest part about implementing a program like this in in any organization at all? Can you repeat oh, uh, the last sorry. section? I think you had said what, what part of the... I said uh, my question basically sums up to being what do you think is the hardest part, in your opinion, when it comes to recognizing an area of your company is stagnant in terms of diversity and inclusion? What is the hardest part about implementing that kind of program in that kind of situation? So I'll repeat that if you guys could hear it better, is in parts of the businesses that are stagnant when it comes to diversity and inclusion, you know, what's, how, how are you driving that? What, how are you, you know, being able to have them see? Am I saying that the right way? It's kind of hard for us for some to hear what's, it. Sorry. It's not you, I think it's the low. microphone. Um, what's but, the hardest part about implementing a program to, you know, make that progress or, or to propel it, kind of? Yeah, the hardest part, implementing a program in an area that's stagnant when it comes mm -hmm. to D&I. You know, it's interesting, right? So when you, when you think about diversity and inclusion on the, on the D, you know, we talk about this all the time. D, this is Fred's opinion, um, tends to be about representation of people of color, you know, and women. And, and my belief on, on, on that particular area is that is every leader in our organization has a responsibility to ensure their organization is diverse, right? And so therefore, if your leadership holds you accountable, which is what you, Dr. Toro, just said, address, I want to hold you accountable, then you begin to see a shift. Right, um, the inclusion component um, is challenging, right? Because you're, you're you're getting at people's what we've been talking about: their values, their biases, their beliefs, their judgments, and you've got to change not just their heads; you've got to also help them see things differently and change their hearts, right? So they're both equally as difficult. Difficult, but the one that's mo perhaps not easiest, but um, from a quantitative perspective, from a measurement perspective, easier to 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 push is representation. And so, um, you know, 
people are, we're, we're out there. You know, uh, if you look at this, the stats, there's no reason why we shouldn't look inside um, institutions, whether it's academia or corporate or otherwise, just like we look on the outside. We, we have got to start looking at ourselves more, more closely and holding ourselves accountable. But, but I think that there is a language that uh, industry and businesses understand, and that is the economic impact and, and the financial impact that the lack of diversity will have for businesses. So it's a business imperative. If you really want to uh, be part of the certain uh, markets, you need to have a diverse uh, workforce because there's no other way to sometimes penetrate certain uh, Markets, so it's it's a business uh, imperative. I would probably add to this. So, um, in a lot of organizations, young people are coming into um, organizations to help. They're they're brought in to bring new ideas. They're typically the closest to new technology and new advancements. And then they get there and they feel like, well, what the heck? I'm surfacing all these really great ideas. No one's listening to me. They're, they, you know, they're, it, you know, the land of steady habits, right? We call it Connecticut. Um, we, it, they have great ideas, but they feel completely squelched around getting those ideas advanced in an organization. I'm working in a large organization up in Boston right now, and we hear so much from the the uh, less tenured employees that they come from other major major companies. They bring the ideas to the table, and they get told things like. No, that's not how we do it here. So what's the sense, right? And so for those of you that are in industry that have the opportunity to um, have young people in the organization, let's not lose that opportunity. Let's get some reverse mentoring going. Let's figure out what we can learn and pull in ways to have more productivity in the organization. Do we still have to have that paper notebook or can we move to the calendar online, right? So let's not lose the energy. And I think that sometimes happens, especially in organizations that have been around for 150 or 200 years, which there are a number of those companies in this area. Right, so we have to find ways. And I would say if you're in a role, if you're a young person in a role and you have an opportunity like this, ask for coaching, ask for mentoring, ask for ideas for how to advance your new idea. Because sometimes there's a great idea, but it needs a little bit more thought and a little bit more meat to it before it can actually be a change. Because maybe the change that you're proposing is gonna have a downstream negative impact in another organization, and a more senior person already understands that because they've been around for a long time. So how do you keep learning? How do you think more systems so end to end so that you can get those ideas implemented in the organization? Don't give up. Just find another way to advance your ideas. I mean, I think you, you need to motivate people. You need to celebrate those moments when you are very successful. And then you need to hold people accountable. Let me give you a real quick story. When I came into the department, there were some people who did really some bad things, especially around the investment area. But basically, law enforcement would not take a case unless there's a loss of a million dollars or more. I had a lot of losses that were smaller, 60,000, 150,000, but to those people, that was their life savings, right? Somebody who loses a million dollars and that's part 5% of their income, it's not the same impact. So how to get law enforcement interested to work with me? So they will work with me for anything a million dollars or more, right? But they won't work with me something less. So I refuse to work with them with a million dollars or more. <laughs> so I say, you won't work with me, I won't work with you. I'm happy to announce, last, like for instance, last October, there was a grand jury indictment of an individual who stole $60,000 from an elderly person. That would have not happened five years ago. And part of that was because if they need my help with a money laundering case or a bigger case, you're gonna help me with the smaller cases. So you gotta sometimes hold people accountable. That's really true. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, adult learners, woohoo. Um, <laughs> uh, so I am uh, wondering where is that line? Diversity is great, it develops an organization, it's what makes it strong, builds a foundation. And at the same time, where is that level of competency, the abilities and skills that you need in order to do a job? 
I happen to be in a workplace right now with 15 women. It is me and one other guy and 15 women. I don't know if any of you have ever done that or been in a work situation where it's been you and one other person and 15 women. So as you can imagine, it's a very different workplace than I've ever worked in before. And it's been a huge change in my perceptions. But my question at the end of the day was, when we hired five more employees and not one of them was man, when does it become that diversity is more important than the skills that we're saying? I, I don't think that we have uh, mentioned that diversity is more important than the skills that are needed. Uh, I think that the mention, it was mentioned that in a specific case, I think it was George, that hired a female uh, because she was the most qualified of them all. And, and it's not about lowering standards. It's not a lot about lowering uh, require uh, qualifications is about hiring the most qualified person that comes from a diverse background. I, I think that that's what we are talking about here. And <laughs> I, I think that that's uh, the main issue. Having been in a male dominated field all my life, an engineer, I know of practices in engineering in which you have the resume of two candidates and the resumes are looked at in a very different way based on gender. What is acceptable in a resume of a male engineer may not be acceptable in the resume of a female engineer. Assertiveness, for example, is seen in the male resume as highly desirable. If you're looking at a female resume, she's a troublemaker. I, I, there's <laughs> applause, applause. All right. Um, I, I would, um, I think Dr. Toro answered your question beautifully. But what I will just give you from a context standpoint, um, I volunteer for an organization called Untapped Potential. Um, this is an organization that brings together women who are educated, that made a conscious decision to step out of the workforce to have children. And now they've been trying for a couple of years or more to get back in the workforce. Do you know how hard it is to make a decision to take care of your family and then be penalized when you're trying to get back into the workforce, when you have the education, you have the credentials, you maybe just don't have two years of work experience. I mean, it's, it's amazingly frustrated. So I applaud Candace Friedenberg, who started this nonprofit organization to help these women. And by the way, Dr. Toro, she started with women engineers and helping them get back into the workforce. And so I, I'm so, pleased that in 2019, and it started in 2018, um, that there is a program like this because absent that, how do women who have spent their time getting their credentials, getting some work experience, get back on track? So I am so excited to hear those 15 women are there. Hang in there. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I would add to that, I mean, you know, so I, I have worked predominantly with women and in some, in some occasions been the only male or one of two males. But so here's the opportunity, right? Because it's a great question. So I would suggest, I was talking earlier about conversation, sitting with these very powerful 15 women, influential, and asking the question, what might we be missing if we're not more diverse? Right? What might we be missing? Because it's a conversation worth having um, so that the decks are clear and everyone knows, like, yes, we might be missing that capability or this X point of view. So try leading a conversation like that. Thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. You're Thanks for the question. Got time for one more. Any more questions? One more question? So I, I have to, you know, end this by a couple things. Um, one, I, I think that the panelists, each one of you have had a story of perseverance, uh, resiliency, kind of what's next. And I absolutely want to take the time 
to say thank you for spending the last hour, hour and 15 minutes discussing it. I also want to share that we were a little single-minded tonight. COCC was a little single-minded tonight in the, in the standpoint that we asked our management team to show up and be here. Well, why do you think we were so single-minded tonight to say we want you to be here? Because of me. <laughs> you may uh, be in the process of transforming your organization. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so we are an organization that, yes, we, we service banks and credit unions. Yes, it's about technology. But at the end of the day, it's about people. And how we continue, it's an evolving process for us. Mm -hmm. So we are in the business of having great people to have great service. And so from a, from a management perspective, it's about ensuring that that never stops. So each one of you in this audience came here tonight because we wanted to make sure that there was a prominence of importance that this is something that's continuous. Building a culture of engagement starts with ensuring that you're looking at an inclusive mindset. And I believe no matter what role you play, even beyond our COCC management team, anyone in this audience tonight, any role that you're in, you can create inclusiveness around you. You can do that by ensuring that you are listening to the 15 other women or the three other men. Uh, and that goes a long way. So to the concept of single-mindedness, I think sometimes you have to be a little bold to say, we want this, we are looking for this to continue. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop with one training. It doesn't stop, stop with one co you know, conversation. It's a continuous process. Because uh, at the end of the day, we are in a business that's all about people. So having great people, having people who are engaged, uh, be, being, being okay with being different, bringing those ideas. Um, innovation starts from the edge. And innovation starts from the person that's sitting next to you that's asking a question that you just didn't think of. That's where it starts. So I did want to share that a little bit tonight and uh, certainly say thank you to everyone that's in the audience. And uh, absolutely one last round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for your conversation tonight. Thank you. I'm going to, as the white male, I'm going to shove the, uh, shove the seat out. <laughs> Did I say that or just think it? Uh, no, again, I want to uh, echo Lisa's thanks of, of all of you for coming out tonight. I want to thank Lisa Jacoby for being such an excellent uh, moderator. I would like also to thank American Savings Foundation, whose generosity is what makes this possible. and the CEO of uh, COCC and our ASF Distinguished Banking Chair, Rich Leone. Thank you, Rich. So again, I think a lot to think about uh, tonight. A lot of great ideas came out, and hopefully, uh, as Lisa said, uh, some of them will stick with you and uh, give you something to think about. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a great evening.